Hello and welcome back to our Solar Power Summit studio on day three of our Solar Power Summit. I'm Walburga Heimatsberger, CEO of Solar Power Europe, and I'm your host of day three. So in this session, we are going to finally reveal our first European market outlook on residential storage, uh, which will be very exciting. And we have the pleasure to discuss the findings and afterwards with a distinguished panel. But uh, to do so, I'm going to hand over now to the moderator of this session, Michael Schmeler, Executive Advisor and Head of Market Intelligence here at Solar Power Europe. Uh, Michael, I, I think everyone is now very curious uh, to know how the residential storage market will evolve in the next five years and get the latest figures from you and, uh, and also Rafaela, who is sitting here next to me, which will be in the picture in a couple of minutes. Okay, super. Thanks, Valborga. Um, yeah, very glad to have a cozy three-person panel for the next 45 minutes to talk, to talk about solar and storage for European homes, in which we will also, as, as you said, uh, introduce our first report on residential battery storage. Just let me talk about um, and say some few words why we as Solar Power Europe, as a solar sector association, are so heavily engaging in the field of battery storage. Um, so, well, both um, solar and storage will play main roles in the European energy transition. We've heard that in a couple of um, discussions um, during the last few days. And they will do that in a very close interaction for many reasons we will discuss today. So when I talk about the two, my favorite description is that this is actually a marriage made in heaven. And while the number of marriages in Europe, unfortunately, is rather trending down, increasingly also leading to divorces, battery attachment rates for new system only move up. Long time solar systems may find a storage partner after they fall out of support schemes or simply because storage is getting only more and more attractive. The devices look more beautiful, they are financially more attractive. Unfortunately, and that's why we're also here, this lovely couple has to overcome quite some hurdles to be able to realize their dream marriage in many countries in Europe today. So with our distinguished panel, uh, we want to discuss that today. So we have with us, um, Pia Alina Lange, who is the head of internal and external communications of Recharge Batteries, that's the European Association of Batteries. We have with us Felix Demski, Vice President Regulatory at Sonnen and very active in our storage stream. So we're very thankful always for Felix's support and help uh, in getting our, our asks um, uh, communicated. Um, and we have last but not least, and who will be the first speaker as he will introduce um, our our first report on battery and um, residential battery storage, Raffaello Rossi, who's uh, a policy analyst for Solar Power Europe, uh, works with me in market intelligence and is also coordinating the work stream storage um, that we have at Solar Power Europe. Raffaella, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. So indeed, let's get started. So I'm indeed very delighted to be here today presenting the first uh, Solar Power Europe uh, European market outlook for residential battery storage, the first of its kind. Uh, which is publicly available from today on our website. We are looking at uh, uh, the evolution of the uh, residential battery storage market, uh, or in short, uh, residential BES, uh, as uh, we, we call it in, in jargon. Um, and we see a very dynamic sector with uh, high growth potential. But indeed, uh, battery storage is uh, one of the fundamental tools for, for energy consumers. It uh, allows uh, citizens and customers to uh, be part of the energy transition by greening their uh, energy consumption and maximize their soil consumption from the energy produced on their solar roofs, even when in times when the sun doesn't shine. 
But actually, battery storage goes beyond that. It also contributes to system flexibility as a whole. It provides firmness, flexibility, as well as balancing services to the grid, and therefore are an essential tool in the future energy world uh, characterized by high penetration of variable renewable energy sources. In uh, this uh, first uh, uh, European market outlook for residential BES, we are indeed looking at a high dynamic sector with uh, large prospo uh, growth prospects. We have looked uh, at the historical evolution of battery storage capacity across Europe uh, with uh, a deep dive into the leading markets, looking at drivers and barriers for deployment. Uh, on top of that, as we did for uh, its uh, European uh, PV counterpart, uh, so the global market outlook and the European market outlook, we provide a five-year forecast under three different scenarios where we factor in um, a number of, of, uh, of uh, factors, including um, the impacts of COVID-19 and, and the slowdown due to lockdown measures, as well as possible uh, regulatory change across different jurisdictions. So before we start with uh, um, the uh, actual market, let's, uh, let's look at the underlying reasons of, of why storage is becoming so attractive for, for so many house owners. Um, we can see that uh, there has been a rapid and continuous decrease in, uh, in cost for PVs and batteries, uh, which is one of the, indeed, the key reasons for, for its attractiveness. Uh, in Germany, one of the largest markets that we'll see in a moment, uh, between 2015 and 2019, the uh, uh, prices for solar have decreased by 18% uh, for residential PV and for residential batteries by uh, 40%. And this trend is set to continue in the future. Uh, we expect by 2023, these prices to, to go forward uh, down 10% uh, further for PV and 33% for, for battery storage being a, a novel technology that is still uh, undergoing uh, quite drastic cost reductions. So um, at the same time, the spread between electricity prices at retail level and the levelized cost of electricity of solar plus storage is widening. Um, we are seeing that in Germany, uh, which is a country indeed characterized by very high retail electricity prices, the uh, LCOE is today at half um, that the LCOE of storage and solar is uh, half of the retail electricity price. And we expect this trend to continue in the future. So the economics of solar and storage at residential level are only improving. Now, looking at the market, uh, we do see uh, an overall strong growth for home batteries in, uh, in Europe. In 2019, 745 megawatt hour of storage capacity were installed year on year. Uh, this is a quite large growth, 57% growth compared to 2018. Uh, and this is the, the reason, uh, the reason is a highly new, highly dynamic market, which is expanding rapidly with a handful of pioneers, which we'll see in a moment. Um, um, the market has grown compared to 2016 by almost four times. Only three years ago, we were at a 200 megawatt hour and looking three years back, 2013, the market almost didn't exist at all. Then looking at the total operating capacity, uh, we have reached at the end of 2019, around two gigawatt hours of total installed capacity. Uh, this picture mimics the uh, annual capacities increase because it is set, as said, is a young market that has right, uh, uh, recently developed. So the growth rate year on year on the capacity installation is actually at 60%. But then let's put this into perspective when compared to the total PV uh, uh, installed in Europe at residential level, batteries only cover 7% of this capacity. So we do see a huge retrofit potential for uh, already installed residential PV capacities. And the potential indeed is gigantic because over 90% of European buildings, in fact, do not have solar on the rooftops. Now let's enter a bit into details. We see indeed a handful of pioneers that are, that are driving the market. 
the biggest one and by far the leader is Germany, as you can see in the top left of the graph. 66% of the total capacity in Europe comes from Germany with around 500 megawatt hour installed year on year. A huge growth of 75% in spite of the end of the um, national subsidy scheme provided by the development bank uh, KFW. This has been substituted by uh, a number of regional support schemes, uh, which are currently active in two thirds of about two thirds of the German states, um, and a very high attachment rate of over ninety percent on the new PV capacity. The reasons are indeed, as mentioned, the uh, high electricity prices for for retail electricity compared to favorable conditions for cost of solar and storage. And, uh, and as said, the, the attachment rate is, is very high, one of the highest, well, indeed, the highest in Europe. So nearly every PV system today in Germany comes with a battery because of this favorable economics. The second market is Italy, a smaller level, but uh, an interesting market. 89 megawatt hours installed year on year, a 16% growth compared to 2018. The market is driven by generous subsidy schemes that are present at national and regional level. At regional level, there are a few direct uh, incentive schemes, and at national level, a 50% uh, tax credit uh, fiscal incentive on top of a 110% uh, fiscal incentive provided through the uh, recent recovery package for uh, energy efficiency improvement. At the third point, uh, the third place, we see the United Kingdom. However, here the picture is quite different. Uh, the growth is limited due to the uh, low residential PV market. So we have 38 megawatt hours installed last year, but a rather stagnating market. Since the end of the feed-in tariffs for, for solar PV in 2019, the market has somehow stagnated and that impacts as well the battery market. Um, on the other hand, we do see uh, at the fourth space uh, Austria, which has a similar size of the market, but a completely different story, even considering, especially considering the, the country's size. Uh, we have a highly dynamic market that is supported by um, national and regional support schemes, so direct incentives both at uh, the national level and at, the, at the, the regional level. And on top of that, strong ambition by the government, uh, promoting one million rooftop program and 100% renewable electricity target by 2030. So looking outside of the top five, however, the rest of Europe counts for less than 10% of uh, total market installation. So besides these few pioneers, there is, there is little going on. Um, we have markets still at the very early stage or even non-existing at the moment. Now let's have a look at the future outlook for the next five years. We do see sustained growth to continue in spite of COVID-19 which has indeed had an impact on PV and on storage. However, being the largest market, Germany, uh, been somewhat, not so much impacted by, by COVID lockdown measures, uh, the market will continue to grow. So contrarily to, to the PV market expectations, we do see uh, a market growth for 2020, although to uh, the uh, one digit growth. So we expect a price plus 9% growth up to 810 megawatt hour for, for the, this current year. Already in 2021, we are much more upbeat. We, uh, we see uh, coming back to uh, the two digit growth. Um, this is due especially to the fact that we, we are expecting um, recovery packages being implemented and boosting recovery also with the end of the lockdown measures. Uh, so indeed, we are quite a, a bit about the market in spite of COVID and already in 2022, under our mid scenario, we are expecting to reach the one gigawatt hour size annual market. The story changes quite a lot when considering uh, looking at the worst and the best uh, scenarios, so the low and high scenario. Uh, if everything went well, uh, we could see 100, um, one gigawatt scale already happening in 2020. 
um, in 2020. This is not necessarily the case, but we it could be plausible because the, in case the recovery packages are, are quickly implemented and, and the economic recovery is sustained. However, in the low scenario, what could happen is that the, the implementation of recovery packages is slow and implementation also of the clean energy package provisions for prosumers and for storage is slow to be implemented and that could lead to a stiffly market at 0.6 gigawatt hour for 2020. Um, in uh, the uh, um, medium scenario, we see uh, a growing market of two-digit rates leading to uh, about 1.5 gigawatt hours by 2024. For the low scenario, we are still beneath, um, uh, beyond one gigawatt in 2024, whereas uh, the two digits range for uh, two gigawatt hours of installation could be reached under optimal conditions, so under the high scenario. Then looking at cumulative capacity forecasts, uh, indeed, we, we continue to see this, uh, this uh, stable and, and strong growth. Um, um, it's an early stage segment, so 41% uh, growth year on year on, on cumulative terms, reaching 2.8 uh, gigawatt hours of operating fleet already in 2020. Under the mid scenario, we expect within five years to have 7.2 gigawatt hours installed. However, the picture could look quite different if bad uh, policies are implemented or rather uh, if uh, implementation of the provisions I mentioned a moment ago are actually driven forward. So our range is between 5.6 gigawatt hour and 9 gigawatt hour by 2024. Now let's have a quick closer look at uh, uh, the main markets, so Germany and Italy. Germany, at first, uh, as mentioned, the main market drivers have been the high electricity prices and the decrease in feed-in tariff rates. Uh, BES are expected to continue to follow residential PV deployment, which is uh, going steadily in uh, uh, the market, and the attachment rate for new system is already, as mentioned, 90% today. We expect a 9% growth of the market in spite of COVID. Uh, and this is due to a couple of reasons. The first one, that is in spring, uh, there was a rush of solar installations uh, because there was this looming 52 uh, gigawatt cap on solar subsidies, uh, and that made installers or customers to to rush for installations because it was not clear whether there would be there would have been enough time to to provide uh, a new uh, regulation for the post 52 gigawatts. This in the end didn't take place, but that led to a rush of installations. And then the second reason is that in summer, there were rumors of the new revision of the feed-in tariff in Germany, uh, which include might include provisions of um, changes in the legislation that would hamper storage and, and active customers. And that also is leading to a rush of installation towards the, the end of 2020. Um, then we do see a slowdown of the market for 21 and 2021 and 2022, because we don't really know what's going to happen with the new EEG law. But then again, in 2023, we expect a new surge of installation. And that is the kick in of the huge post feed in tariff rate of feed potential. Um, systems that applied for a feed-in tariff 20 years ago are now exiting the feed-in tariff and now they have a strong incentive to uh, install a battery storage system together with uh, uh, their um, rooftop system so this uh, this capacity one moment yes. uh, this uh, this capacity will become uh, quite significant starting from 2023 onwards and then to conclude, uh, an interesting other market as said is Italy, but it's a different picture. We have strong subsidy schemes here rather than high electricity uh, prices. Um, the 50% fiscal incentive, the 110% energy efficiency depreciation that are driving the market. Uh, the second one was implemented through the recovery package. It will be valid until the end of next year. There is, however, high uncertainty because most of these uh, support schemes are uh, reno um, refurbished, um, renovated and confirmed every year. So they might be continuing or they might not. But however, under the mid scenario, we have a demand uptick already in 2021 due to the boosting of the recovery packages, followed by constant two digit growth. 
If you want to have more information about the market uh, uh, outlook, I can kindly invite you to, to check it out on our website, it's publicly available, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank you for the attention. Michael, back to you. Thanks, Raphael. A great introduction, uh, a lot of food for discussion. So um, what Raphael showed is um, that, um, and I think that's probably not different from what we saw in, uh, in, in the PV market uh, in the early days in Europe. Uh, there's only few markets, uh, in particular, in fact, it's actually one market which is um, <clears throat> driving growth in Europe today. So um, what are the main challenges um, we, we, we are seeing um, that, that's really hindering um, residential solar and storage to grow faster? I can, I can start with a follow-up from my presentation, perhaps. So, to me, some of the main reasons are indeed that the policy frameworks, not all policy frameworks, most of the policy frameworks, in fact, are still not favorable for solar and storage. Uh, many regulations are stifling the market, um, and this could come from um, support policies that were initially designed for, for PV. The typical example is net metering, which is, which is great for, for PV deployment, but is, is really bad for, for storage. Um, then the fact that countries are really, or battery operators are not really able to access different revenue streams. It's, uh, it's, it's a big hurdle in my view, uh, because it will really favor uh, the economic craftiness of, uh, of, uh, of these devices. Um, and third, I think that countries should acknowledge the, um, the potential of storage installation of distributed storage. Uh, especially when looking at the 2050 energy system in which we have massive electrification and the need for flexibilities to accommodate the penetration of re variable renewable sources. Um, Michel, if, if I can add to, to, to what Rafael just said. So first of all, thank you for, for the report. I think it is very important. Um, I come from an industry association that represents the batteries market. So this is our daily business. Um, but what I would like to say is, and it's actually the other way around, you know, what has driven um, battery storage. And I think there are two factors. The one is cost. I think we have seen a tremendous cost reduction curve when it comes to batteries. And I think that was significant to drive uh, market penetration, at least in those uh, markets where we have a favorable incentive scheme already in place. And the other thing that I would like to highlight is the uptake of EV. I think the uptake of EV has changed the perception how we as end users um, perceive battery storage and battery energy, right? And I think, you know, when you have a car, an electric vehicle in your home, and you also have maybe a, a PV installation on your roof, I think the jump from installing afterwards also um, a battery storage system, you know, it's a very, it's a very small jump, right? And I think that has helped actually. And, you know, when we are coming back to the picture of where is um, PV in conjunction with battery energy storage taking place, I think these are also countries where there is a lot of support from the national um, governments, but also a lot of support from the public for electric mobility. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to add to that. The, um, I want to add first, uh, what's not the main obstacle? The main obstacle is definitely not customer demand. Uh, we at Zonen, we've got some 50,000 batteries installed worldwide now all over the globe. And we get inquiries from customers from all over the world every day. So there's clear customer demand for solar and storage. And what we typically find is that the main obstacles are typically on the regulatory uh, front. <clears throat> so you will typically always find in these markets some legacy regulation which was once written for much larger storage systems uh, which exist most likely uh, pumped hydro systems in these markets and these these old rules for storage will typically not really work for, um, for smaller installations so you will find you will always find a strange obstacle in every market that could be metering that could be building code, that could be connection issues to the grid, et cetera. 
And what you typically need at this point is a regulator who is willing not only to apply these rules on a non-discriminatory basis, but a, a regulator who actually says, this looks, it looks interesting, let's try it out. And we've seen this in more and more countries. Um, you said Germany was the leading market and still is the leading market. Until recently, we always used to joke that we actually sold twice as many batteries to Sweden than we sold to Spain. And if you look at, uh, at the sunlight in Sweden, that doesn't make any sense. So the, the reasons are regulatory. Spain is now picking up. Um, so what you need on this front is actually regulators who say, um, this is a very interesting technology. It's been matured quite a lot of the, over the past years. And the cost curves are really, really interesting. Let's try it. And we see more and more regulators picking up that idea all over Europe. Okay. I, I just can echo this one. I just can echo this one. And I really must say that right now we have a unique opportunity with the revision of the uh, Renewable Energy Directive, with the revision of the batteries legislation, right? But also with, you know, the recovery, the green recovery funds, etc. We have to write funds in place. We have to write political direction, vision in place. Um, so these are actually very exciting times and these are definitely times also to better recognize battery storage um, or the services that battery storage systems bring to end users and to the grid uh, in our regulation. Yeah, I think um, regulators usually um, are conservative, they need some uh, push of <laughs> 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 I'll probably experience and um, I think we, ha we have a, actually a great template for residential and both um, residential solar and residential storage and uh, that was actually made in Brussels, the clean energy package. So I think um, all of us uh, active in this field were actually quite pleased what came out in the end um, in, in many of these directives. Um, so, but this means that actually uh, it uh, accounts for and will be will be will have to be imp implemented everywhere in the European Union. So, why are we seeing only so few markets so far? Or can we expect actually that? Of course, it takes a little time, and some countries, um, as we know, also take more time than they should. Uh, that this template will be basically enough to to get with the storage decreasing storage cost the market going? Well, the, the clean energy package is, is a beautiful template for solar and storage. Storage is addressed quite a lot in the relevant articles, especially Article 15, 32 of the Market Design Directive and Article 21 of the Renewable Energy Directive. And um, I think the direction Brussels gave the member states there is very clear. Um, our impression is that this direct, those directives have been passed now quite a long time ago and we hope everyone's working on them because in three months they need to be implemented in all member states. And what we see is um, also from the, the um, requests we get from regulators on, on how to do it, um, what we see is that some are more eager than others and we also see some countries which are not that eager to actually implement those rules. Uh, Germany being one example where we still yet uh, we're still waiting for actually draft legislation to implement the clean energy package. So it's a it's a beautiful template, um, but it takes more than just a few really good lawyers to to write new laws and then write that into law. It needs a national push, which basically says, okay, this is something we really want to try out. And if regulators are, you know, bold in that respect. It usually pays off. It usually pays off. Um, Germany started this, uh, I think, five years ago with a small uh, support scheme from the National uh, Support Bank, KFW. And what that was was a financial incentive. But the most, most important signal which was sent there is that the government backs the idea of solar and storage and that installers had a certain degree of, of security when they started to enter that market. And you know, train their workforce, build up the capacity, etc. And that signal, um, uh, that was the most important part. And that carries on. The, the support scheme has run out a few years ago. It was, um, there was a lot of 
uh, also research on the site to learn more about storage systems and their performance. And it laid the basis for a very strong storage industry in Germany, which is now being exported to the other member states. There's also interesting companies from other member states. But if you move early, that typically also means you have a first mover advantage in your national uh, industrial policy. So it's really worth doing. Fully agree with this. And I mean, um, PV has been on the market for quite some time. Batteries have been on the market for quite some time. But the combination of PV and, and battery storage, you know, I don't want to sound too inspirational, right? But I think it really allows us to reimagine our electricity system, right? So it is indeed disruptive. And I think if we want to have a high penetration uh, rate, we need to have incentive schemes that provide certainty. You mentioned the installers before, uh, Felix. They, you know, they are the, the interface, the very important interface between the manufacturers and the consumer. We need them to understand the, 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 the legal systems, the incentive systems, but we also need them to understand you know, what can batteries and PV really bring as benefit. Um, so I just really can echo what you just said before. Okay. So the, what, what, what we see also is, of course, I think um, we probably have to discuss a bit more about Germany because on the one hand, it's so big and so dominant. On the other hand, we see obviously now at the moment the EEG being revised, the feed-in tariff law, and actually the, the provisions that were in the, in the first draft, actually that were everything but favorable to, uh, to prosumers. Um, and, uh, I think it was rather complicated. It would have made things difficult. And actually, I think that at some point there were even uh, suggestions to introduce net metering in Germany. Um, so, um, uh, Felix, maybe, I don't know, so you can elaborate a little bit on that. I think most of your time you deal with this <laughs> these days. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to bore our international audience with the specifics of, of German feed and tariff regulation, but. Um, um, what we see, what we have on the table now, is a, a, a re recast of the German feed and tariff law. And it's very strange. Um, the one thing we experience in Germany is that public support for the energy transition doesn't come from nothing. It's, it's very important you understand that you need broad public support for this huge technological transition. And that public support um, doesn't automatically come if top economists say, the system we designed is wholly efficient. That's all you need. But what we see more and more in Germany is, for example, resistance against large wind parks. We see resistance against grid expansion, et cetera. So if, if the people don't have the feeling that um, they can take matters into their own hands, there's resistance to this project, it comes up rather quickly. Um, so we always thought uh, what you need in this, uh, in this stage of the energy transition is actually to make it fun, to make it fun for customers to take matters into their own hands, put a solar panel on your roof, put a storage system in your basement, put an electric vehicle in your garage. And, um, and when you do that and, and people enjoy it, then they will support the next stage of this transition, which will be entirely product-based. Right? We, we now ask everyone in the country to buy these products to support the energy transition. And what we now see in Germany is some sort of a rollback where we see very strange ideas come up that, such as virtual net metering, which luckily didn't make it into the uh, draft legislation. We see very strict rules on what kind of technical equipment you need to install with your battery how much control you need to hand over to the grid operator and some sort of an overall uh, disregard to the, uh, to the interests of the customer. So it's a very strange uh, rollback we see here in the draft legislation and we can only hope that the legislators will still take the time to, to make some improvements on that. To give you an idea, uh, I'm still counting how many different uh, technical setups there will be you have to install in your home i so far have counted somewhere between 26 and 52 um, so each in installer needs to know which type of smart meter with which type of remote control for the for the grid operator with which type of 
uh, device which sends over data to the grid operator they need to install if they make a mistake maybe the customer has to pay back money um, it's all very very strange and very very complicated so what we need i think is something which is way more simple and and to engage customers in a level that they will support this next stage of the energy transition okay so so if we if we look at them at the other countries at the moment because um, um so i think we want to get that going i think felix you already said that um, uh, sweden and you're selling more to sweden than you're you're selling to spain um and um so um what we see is i think sweden has a very attractive incentive scheme um, and i think um rafaela also mentioned that that in um, in, in europe um, or in germany we still have basically i think two-thirds of the states um, still um offering financial incentive um, for storage um, because of course um, the, the, the capital expenses at the beginning are still there so um, so so how, how do we see that how much of incentives do we need to get uh, storage going except from the regulatory hurdles um, especially in, in, in emerging markets yeah, if I may start, uh, from the analysis, it's clearly shown that the top markets still rely on, on subsidies, uh, either direct incentive schemes on, on the investment, uh, as in the case in Italy, in, in Germany and, and in Austria, uh, or some, some form of, of indirect subsidies. And, and where, whereas this uh, is not in, uh, in, uh, in, sp in place, then the market is, is somewhat stifled. And it's not because battery storage is not economical per se, it's because we don't have a regulatory framework that is good enough yet to enable the full potential to be deployed. So in the moment in which you have full flexibility, access to, 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 to providing different services such as entering access to markets, balancing markets, uh, possibility of having um, stacking of different services, removing double taxation, then we might discuss whether subsidies are still relevant. But uh, at this point in time, in my view, subsidies are, are, still, are still something needed. And the good news is that we have a huge amount of money now available through the recovery packages. Uh, and that can be a great opportunity for for investing on battery storage. So, so but, but will we be able also actually really to tap it? Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot a lot of um, hungry mouth asking uh, <laughs> for for this pot that's available. Yeah, in my view, it's really important to to prioritize and, and, and acknowledge the role of storage in, in the future energy systems and especially the, the importance of distributed energy. And in the moment you, you can bring consumption, generation as close as possible to the point of consumption, then you're optimizing the, the energy system as such. Yeah. I think we, we have already seen a couple of countries that actually um, reacted very promptly i think italy uh, for sure and you mentioned that actually i think switzerland also put some money aside for for solar and then uh, actually also in, in, that means also for storage so so uh, uh, is there anything else on the hor direct horizon um, at the moment well what we what what we would like to see indeed is uh, is uh, the use of the recovery package money from a national recovery and resilience plan on direct subsidies on investments as such is uh, the case for for switzerland apparently or indirectly uh, as as italy did with the tax depreciation scheme for energy efficiency improvements but alongside this there should be further support in terms of of softer more indirect measures such as solar mandates for um, for, for, for including storage, tax exemptions for such consumption, dynamic use, uh, t time of use tariffs should also be uh, promoted. I also quickly want to chime in on this one. I mean, when we go back to, you know, other areas, electric mobility, for example, we've seen that the market really took off once governments committed to electric mobility provided the, the relevant subsidies in order to you know, kickstart um, the, the deployment. And then suddenly customers really realize, you know, actually this is a good thing, right? This is an easy thing. This is the kind of mobility that I would like to have. And I think we should see the same kind of mechanisms also for the PV plus uh, storage uh, systems uh, or market, um, because indeed it is still 
it, or at least it can be perceived as a disruptive technology, right? It is still rather new to some um, parts of our of our societies. Um, and if we want, I mentioned before, you know, if we if we want to have a really rapid penetration of that kind of electricity systems, and and electricity independence also, we need to make sure that all parts of our societies have access to storage and, and PV. Because then if we look at the at the national energy plans, the NACPs um, actually was rather, I think for solar it was in general okay, but, but for storage um, um, it was pretty disappointing what was um, written in there, I think, um, or um, So I, I I I cannot go into the into the uh, the country specific uh, regulation or plans, right? I don't know that. Um, but I think that in general, the the services that batteries can offer to the consumer and to the creator, they are not well recognized yet. Um, you know, when I was going through the renewable energy directive, um, preparing for our comments for the public consultation, there was very little of mentioning of storage and especially battery storage but that should be changed because our electricity system is changing we are speaking of more distributed more decentralized uh, electricity systems we need storage solutions right so we cannot just put that on the side and say okay we wait right we can't do that but i think there are drivers that that will push for deployment anywhere. And the one driver is, like I said, e-mobility before, um, but linked to that, uh, I think second life, right? So we see the second life market kicking in for, for batteries from EV being used in energy storage. So even if the legislators are not doing the right thing, the market is doing the right thing. And, and Felix, I think it was extremely important that you mentioned before, there is the demand there is the demand from the consumer side for storage and now legislators and governments they have to prepare our infrastructures we need demand management we need smart chargers we need smart metering etc cetera, etc cetera. and obviously like i said before having the right incentive systems in place um, if i may add to that the a lot of the discussion today was about um, incentives and we have to make sure that we get these right. So in the future, of course, the only incentive we actually would need should come from a, a carbon price. Um, the carbon price should make sure that using the renewable alternative is always more economically viable than using the fossil fueled alternative. However, we're not there yet from the, fossil, uh, from the carbon price. And it seems like regulators have huge difficulties finding a mechanism that would deliver a carbon price, which actually is able to induce technological change. Until then, what you need is other incentives, which you know, allow these technologies to slowly enter the market. And then the key in the next years is to organize the handover from the incentive to the carbon price, so that you don't need these old school subsidies anymore. Looking at the recovery package, However, that means that what you want to look for is uh, if you want to pay uh, incentives in the recovery, what you want to have is a technology which is future proof. Uh, you want to make sure the money is distributed, decentralized all over the country, and you want to make sure it goes to all elements of the workforce, not just the highly skilled or the low skilled work. And I think in that respect, you know, solar is the storage is perfectly fit as a future-proof technology. It's built decentralized all over the country and you need high-skilled workers and low-skilled workers and mid-skilled workers to install it. So I think it's the perfect package um, for the recovery package. So it would be uh, a shame if, if member states would decide not to go down that route. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe one point that's also pretty important is, um, is of course, the, um, um, how we manage the whole thing. The European Commission would like to have the active consumer being a central part of the energy transition. I think that's uh, <laughs> that was uh, uh, yeah, written and published several times in many documents. On the other hand, the consumer wants to be as independent as possible, while at the same time obviously also having the safety net of the grid. There are certain views um, 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 on, on how batteries of consumer 
would be managed in the future. Could be grid operators having that, uh, could be they themselves optimizing that. The question is, how, how will it be actually? Because of course there are different uh, yeah, interests. Um, and uh, so first of all, how, how are you seeing it's, it's happening at the moment, Felix? And of course, how, how would you see it uh, optimally? Well, we need to make sure, of course, that people who have opted for solar and storage make the most of that technology. And there's so much more you can do with the storage system than just you know, increasing your self-consumption. Effectively, during winter, when the sun isn't shining, those systems don't do much all day. So could, you could use them for grid services or for interaction with the system as a whole. Um, we do that with our virtual power plant. Um, but it's very difficult to access certain markets. So what you want to do is you find, you make access to the grid services markets as easy as possible and a little bit fun for the customers. So they do it voluntarily and they do it. And that's a quite different approach than a command and control approach where you just give the grid operator a switch to every storage system they can use as they see fit. To give you a practical example, we provide FCR, uh, Frequency Containment Reserve in Germany, and uh, with the virtual power plant, we stabilize the, the um, grid frequency, and customers love it. They come to us at events, they show us the app uh, with their systems, and they show, look, here, I supported the grid. Uh, we had, on the other hand, seen new rules in Italy, where uh, at a certain deviation of the, fre of the frequency, the grid operator would switch off systems or the systems would switch off themselves. If customers see that happening, what they do is they call the hotline. They say, my system's broken. It just switched off. What happened? Um, and they get really angry about that. Um, so that's the, that it's almost the same thing, uh, but it's vastly different the way you engage the customer and the type of support you get them from. So make it, make it easy, make it fun. They will use their systems to provide uh, control services to the electricity system as a whole. Okay, um, I think uh, time is ticking. <laughs> We're getting close to to the end of that uh, brief panel that we short panel that we had. So maybe, maybe a final question. Um, 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 and so I, I just wanted to to show two slides here from our 100% renewables uh, report, which we um, which we published uh, a couple of months ago, and uh, just to show actually the the dimension we're talking about and and the task we have in front of us. Uh, you can see there until 2050 the three scenarios. Uh, La Penranta University has modeled for us, and um, it doesn't matter. At at, at what you look at, so I think the, the middle one and the right one is always a 100% scenario. But in any scenario, you see basically the big role batteries are playing. So the orange parts, the different shades of um, orange are, are batteries. So that means batteries will provide the bulk of energy, which is mostly electricity based uh, in, in, in 2050. Um, and, um, and so and, and we have to take that into consideration. And I think this is probably also the acknowledgement um, Rafaela was talking about um, that, uh, that, that decision makers have to make. And on the other slide, you see basically total energy demand. And oh, no, sorry, Mos, can you say on the back, back, please? On the back? Oh, yeah. And on the right, um, right um, um, slide, you see um, the right graph. You see basically the total energy demand actually that we're having, and that batteries will basically back up to twenty-five percent of this energy demand. So this is huge what we're talking about. And if you look at the the next slide, actually is so if that is happening, then we don't have to worry because the 100% renewable energy system will provide safe supply in Europe. You see in yellow solar and you see in orange batteries. So in, 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 in combination with the whole orchestra of tools that we will have available, other renewable um, power generation sources and the other tools, so there will, we don't have to be afraid actually also for a, a winter 
in uh, in France, which uh, which we which we've modeled here, for example, in in 2050. So, um, and this brings me to the final question: is so what um, each of you thinks is basically the the the, the key um, the key challenge we have to manage actually first and have to address and focus on very briefly, um, everyone, please. Yeah. Then I will go first, um, since this is really closest to my home. Your slides, they clearly show that there is a significant demand for battery. If we want to have batteries, we need to produce them, right? So I think we have to invest in local um, value chains. And I'm, I'm very happy that, you know, the Commission with the European Battery Alliance has really done a very important kick uh, starting effort to bring the value chain back to Europe. But we need we need to ensure that we really can meet the demand. Um, and then I think what is in, extremely important so that the systems and the batteries are talking to each other and we get the most out of battery storage is that we have the value chains close together, right? We need to have the end users, we need to have the, the PV installers, the PV uh, manufacturers and the battery manufacturers speaking uh, to each other and being close to each other, because then we really can meet this growing and significantly growing demand. And besides that, we need to have access to raw materials. Um, and as you know, um, this week, the European Raw Materials Alliance was, uh, was launched in order to secure the materials that we need in order to supply these strategic value chains, batteries, but also PV, obviously. Yeah, if I mm -hmm. might chime in, I, I second Alina's, Alina's remarks, indeed. Uh, just to add some numbers on our 2050 study, as, as I showed in my presentation, we have um, an annual market or a cumulative uh, operating fleet of two gigawatt hours today, set to go to seven in five years from now. In our 2050 study, under a moderate scenario, in order to, to provide flexibility to a 100% renewable energy system, we need 1,600 gigawatt hours. So we're talking about a massive increase in capacity. So what do we need from, from my point of view? Let's use this opportunity, which is next generation EU funds. We have national and res, uh, recovery and resilience plan through which we can provide direct and indirect uh, support to storage. We have uh, the invest EU uh, strategic investment window, so that that could uh, that should recognize uh, uh, battery storage, uh, stationary storage, a self-standing uh, industrial sector of relevance uh, of, of of strategy. And, um, and establish local industrial ecosystems that could support the new industrial base, as well as uh, the creation of, of jobs, and as well um, initiative, flagship initiative from the, from the European Union, such as the renovation wage, should support uh, storage as part of um, uh, energy efficiency improvements uh, wave. Okay. There's very little I can I can add to that. I think there's two key components. Um, one is economies of scale on the uh, battery production side, which Alina covered quite well, and the other one will be consumer enthusiasm. So uh, what we ask of consumers in the next phase of the energy transition is to adopt really new technologies uh, in their household, be it an electric vehicle, solar, storage, heat pumps, etc. And customers need to be able to, uh, you need to create a situation where they actually want to do it. And, and they want to do it if it's easy uh, and if it's interesting and if the, if the technology is integrated into the system. So they've all, they have a level of expectation which is typically set by their smartphone. A smartphone is a ridiculously complicated piece of technology. You can call anyone on this planet just by buying a smartphone putting a chip in, that's it. And we need to get to a level to make solar and storage as easy to handle uh, from customers. So you don't need to have a meeting first with your grid operator and your lawyer, uh, but the way that you can just buy the system, plug it in and then uh, use it for the next 20 years. And we work on that every day. And I would also like to thank uh, Solar Power Europe for working on that every day. I think we're on a very good track there. Great. Um, mobiles, mobile style to facilitate marriage. I like that. Um, Valborga, um, <laughs> back to you. Thanks to the panel and uh, 
Thank you. Bye, Burger. Great discussion uh, and great insights. Thanks very much for that. What I take is that the residential storage market is ready to take up with some tweaks basically to the framework, to the regulatory framework and with the right incentives. And that's a huge opportunity for the recovery plans, which we can seize uh, in this regard. So thanks very much to this great panel and thanks very much to you for joining us. To give you an outlook what's happening this afternoon, this afternoon we will invite you to join our last session uh, of today, of day three of the Solar Power Summit, which will be a very special session. We would like to celebrate with you our 35th anniversary. Unfortunately, we will not be able to raise our glasses to these 35 years of Solar Power Europe, but we would like to treat you with a couple of special guests and with some solar surprises. So please join us again at two o'clock to celebrate with us our 35th anniversary. Happy to see you there.